Welcome to the Watchman Channel. This channel is all about world news and Bible prophecy, pointing to the soon return of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I am asking that if you can, to please help to financially support this ministry. If you feel led to pledge any amount of money, it would be extremely helpful and greatly appreciated. There is a PayPal link in the description box and in my pinned comment below. You can also donate using Cash App. My cash tag is dollar sign watchman 1963 thank you all so much for your prayers and support god bless events are happening faster than we can process them yet nothing startles or amazes us much anymore in the time of the end the book of daniel prophesied that knowledge would increase daniel 12 4 but you daniel shut up the words and seal the book until the time of the end many shall run to and fro and knowledge shall increase knowledge had to increase for future prophecy to be fulfilled the biblical knowledge we have today is because of the increase in technology. There are many prophecies in Daniel's time that could not come to fulfillment because the technology had not yet been invented. That is why Daniel was told to shut up the words and seal the book until the time of the end. In our time, the time of the end, we are witnessing the technology that will bring about the end of days climaxing in the return of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. One of those prophecies is found in Revelation 13, 16 through 18. He causes all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive a mark on their right hand or on their foreheads, and that no one may buy or sell except one who has the mark, or the name of the beast, or the number of his name. Here is wisdom. Let him who has understanding calculate the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man. His number is 666. Knowledge is increasing rapidly in accordance with Daniel's prophecy. And we are seeing an unsaved world rushing headlong into accepting the mark of the beast and they don't even know it. How Canadians pay for everyday things is changing. Some are using less cash in favor of other payment methods. To keep up with the changing ways that people pay, the Bank of Canada is exploring a digital Canadian dollar also known as a central bank digital currency. Simply put, this would be a digital version of cash, but it wouldn't replace cash. It would have the same dollar value and it would be accessible to anyone and everyone. You could use this digital Canadian dollar to buy everyday things, just like you use cash or a bank card, but it would be different. Unlike cash, you wouldn't need to carry multiple bills or change. Like a bank card, it would work for both in-person and online purchases. Similar to banknotes, it could possibly still be used when the internet is not available. Just like the cash in your wallet, it wouldn't earn interest. But it would be secure and private. You could keep your digital dollars securely on a phone, a card, or another device. I hope you see where this is all going. Society is fast moving toward the mark of the beast. As smart devices continue to advance, going from your phone to your watch, the next logical place will be in or on your right hand or forehead. This is the future the Bible has been warning about. We have arrived, make no mistake about it. Central bank digital currency is not a monetary system. It is a social credit system in which the governments of the world will tell you how you can spend your money. We can see that Christians will be persecuted using this system as they will try and force believers in Jesus Christ to adhere to their evil ways. When Christians say no, they will turn off your CBDC account. I hope you see how the mark of the beast comes into play as Christians will not be able to buy or sell. Whether the mark of the beast is an RFID chip, electronic tattoo, or some other device, Christians must be discerning. The Antichrist in the near future will use this technology for his evil purposes of tracking people and controlling their financial transactions all under the guise of worshipping him. The Bible gives us the most dire warning to those who take the mark of the beast and worship his image in Revelation 14, 9 through 11. Then a third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If anyone worships the beast in his image and receives his mark on his forehead or on his hand, he himself shall also drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out full strength into the cup of his indignation. He shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb, and the smoke of their torment ascends forever and ever, and they have no rest day or night who worship the beast and his image 
and whoever receives the mark of his name. The first of God's bold judgments is aimed specifically at those who take the mark of the beast and worship his image as we read in Revelation 16, 1 and 2. Then I heard a loud voice from the temple saying to the seven angels, Go and pour out the bowls of the wrath of God on the earth. So the first went and poured out his bowl upon the earth. And a foul and loathsome sore came upon the men who had the mark of the beast and those who worshipped his image. 1 John 2.18 Little children, it is the last hour. And as you have heard that the Antichrist is coming, even now many Antichrists have come, by which we know that it is the last hour. Jesus said, as a sign of his coming and the end of the age, there would be an increase in deception, false Christ who will deceive many, wars and rumors of wars, nation against nation and kingdom against kingdom, famines, pestilences, earthquakes, Christian persecution, apostasy, false prophets, and lawlessness causing the love of many to grow cold. Jesus said all of these signs would come like birth pains. Jesus was likening last day's events to a woman in labor. As the labor progresses, the pains increase in both frequency and intensity until the baby finally comes. As we get closer to Jesus' return, all the signs he gave us as a sign of his coming and the end of the age will become more frequent and more intense. All of these signs are manifesting around the world in our time. Now to the war in Ukraine and the reported signs Kyiv is gearing up for its counteroffensive. This is President Zelensky is in Rome meeting with Pope Francis. ABC's Marcus Moore is in Kyiv with the latest. There were new airstrikes overnight in parts of Ukraine, including here in the Kyiv region. And Ukraine says Russia launched 21 of its Shahid drones. 17 of those were intercepted as new video captures the chaos on the front line. This morning, Ukrainian forces advancing, pushing back Russian troops as Ukraine prepares for its expected major counteroffensive. Ukrainian forces saying they're making a number of successful counterattacks around Bakhmut, inflicting heavy casualties on Russian fighters, forcing some to run from their positions. This body camera footage showing Ukrainian troops rushing out of an armored vehicle on the battlefield near Bakhmut. A grenade purportedly thrown by Russian troops lands nearby. The Ukrainian soldiers run to safety. The dramatic footage also showing Ukrainian troops discovering a Russian foxhole and destroying it with a grenade. These videos circulating online amid reports of shelling in Russian-occupied Luhansk, and this video capturing smoke billowing from an industrial plant in the city. What caused the explosion not yet confirmed. Those blasts coming just a day after the UK said it supplied Ukraine with long-range storm shadow cruise missiles. Now Russia, which has spent months making Bakhmut its main offensive goal, not only failing to fully take the prize region, but reportedly suffering more setbacks in its war effort. Meanwhile, President Zelensky is in Rome today for a meeting with the Pope, who, um, as you know, from the very beginning has been calling for peace between Russia and Ukraine, as this war now stretches into 14 months and an untold number of deaths. Matthew 24, 6 and 7. And you will hear of wars and rumors of wars, See that you are not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet, for nation will rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. Nation is the Greek word ethnos, which means a race, as of the same habit, i.e. a tribe, especially a foreign, non-Jewish one, Gentiles, usually by implication, pagan. What I believe Jesus is saying here is that there have always been wars and rumors of wars. But when you see the same ethnic group fighting the same ethnic group, now pay attention. His return is near. The clouds of smoke billowing over Khartoum show there's no let up in the fighting. It's been like this for a month. Once thriving city streets reduced to empty, dusty and dangerous supply lines for Sudan's warring factions. The UN estimates that 19 million people here are at risk of starvation. It's really heartbreaking. It's hell. Uh, it's every day people struggling to find uh, water because there's no more running water, uh, struggling to find food, uh, struggling to, uh, you know, move around because, you know, uh, you can be caught in a crossfire uh, if just because you want to go and buy some food. And if you do arrive to a shop, then the prices are skyrocketing and uh, everybody's running out of cash as well because the banks have been closed for the past 26 days. The battle for power between rival generals that began in mid-April unleashed a tide of refugees. 700,000 fleeing the fighting, 150,000 going to neighboring countries, any way they can. Many aid workers also left a place too dangerous for them to work in. 
They remain fearful that the civil war will only intensify or spread, trapping more civilians. Luke 2125, and there will be signs in the sun, in the moon, and in the stars, and on the earth distress of nations, with perplexity, the sea and the waves roaring. One of the many signs we are living in the last days right before the return of Jesus Christ is nations will be in a state of perplexity or uncertainty over what to do in a difficult situation. This is exactly what is happening in our world today. Tens of thousands of new refugees have poured into Chad from West Darfur. The latest and perhaps clearest sign, violence inside Sudan is getting worse. Civilians abandoning their homes in exchange for their lives only to find themselves almost immediately in another fight for survival. Their Chadian hosts try to allay fears, but the situation here, local officials say, is getting out of hand. If they don't get tents, if they don't get water and food, if they don't get clothes to wear, they will die at this place, just as you see them now. I'm asking you to help these people. Help is coming, but slowly. Aid agencies, the local government, military and police all agree they haven't seen anything like this so far since the conflict began. If we just walk over here, you can get a sense of how enormous the scale of this humanitarian crisis is. The tents in this makeshift camp, they just keep going and going. Really, this represents an enormous humanitarian challenge ahead. How scarce everything is, how remote this place is, and how little these people fled with really means that the humanitarian crisis ahead, the challenge ahead, is enormous. Fighting in Khartoum between Sudan's army and the paramilitary rapid support forces is destabilizing the whole country. But the conflict is complex. Sudan in general and Darfur particularly have long been the scene of ethnic fighting, pitting Arabic-speaking communities against African ones. Exactly who is behind the latest violence in West Darfur remains unclear. Perhaps the truest picture comes from the refugees. The Arabs are killers. They killed a lot of people. They took the cows and scared the children away. People left without finding their children. I don't know, maybe they died of thirst or hunger. We didn't lose any children, but they killed my uncle. The children over there, their father was killed. People living in these camps lack the most basic provisions. It is a struggle to perform simple tasks. And being in this place requires grit. Still, they say it is better to face thirst, hunger, and homelessness than the barrel of a gun. And so they keep coming. Aid agencies expect numbers to surpass previous estimates. The rains are coming too. Without adequate shelter, they risk disease, illness, more misery. The humanitarian crisis sparked by the conflict in Sudan is spilling over. Wakale, they sing. The phrase represents the new movement that has taken over the streets of Haiti. People are tired of gangs controlling their lives, and that's why they decided to start fighting back. Jean-Baptiste Kenly says the movement will get bigger every day. The Bois Calais, it's a campaign of vaccination against gang violence. The Bois Calais will continue to eradicate the kidnapping virus in the country. Gangs now control 80% of Haiti's capital, and they're extending their presence to other parts of the country. People say they have had enough and have started to go after gang members. Some have been set on fire on the streets. Chaos has taken over this Caribbean nation. Neighborhoods like this one have been transformed by the violence in the past months. I'm here in the neighborhood of Beler. This area used to be filled with people, but as you can see right now, it's almost empty. It looks like a war zone. There's been fighting going on between rival gangs. We're told that members of the G9 gang are not far away from here, and they have been attacking this area. Yeah, yeah. Emmanuel showed us around the area. He says gangs are ruthless. They have set on fire houses here. They also rape and kill. The United Nations says the violence has increased malnourishment in the country by 30 percent. Over 100,000 children are at risk of dying because of hunger. 
The interim prime minister, Ariel Henry, has requested urgent international assistance to help the government fight the gangs. Even though it's been six months since the request was made, there has not been an answer. This should be a force, a multilateral force, uh, with the leadership of one country, whatever country. Unfortunately, there is no country who has been able to accept this, this uh, great challenge. Uh, and so now we're, we are at the point that we require uh, innovative ways to uh, find different solutions. While the international community continues debating what to do about Haiti, people have been left on their own, going after those who hurt them and waiting for a solution that never seems to arrive. Is global chaos the new normal? As anyone can plainly see, the world is in a state of decay, moral, economic, political, every way possible. People are saying the world is out of control and looking for someone, anyone, to rescue the planet. Soon, very soon, a leader will appear on the horizon that appears to have all the answers, to calm the oceans, to bring peace to all the nations. His title will be the Antichrist, and he will be welcomed by millions of those on earth not taken with the rapture. Unfortunately, his true identity will be known soon to those left behind that his true intentions are death, destruction, and control. So yes, global chaos is the new normal until the Lord Jesus Christ comes at the end of the Antichrist's seven-year reign of terror and establishes true peace on earth. It seems like a good time for Satan to present the lawless one to the world. 2 Thessalonians 2, 7-12 For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he who now restrains will do so until he is taken out of the way. And then the lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord will consume with the breath of his mouth and destroy with the brightness of his coming. The coming of the lawless one is according to the working of Satan, with all power, signs, and lying wonders, and with all unrighteous deception among those who perish, because they did not receive the love of the truth, that they might be saved. And for this reason, God will send them strong delusion, that they should believe the lie, that they all may be condemned who did not believe the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. John 15, 18 through 20. If the world hates you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love its own. Yet because you're not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Remember the word that I said to you, a servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. Jesus said as a sign of his coming and the end of the age, Christians would be persecuted as we read in Matthew 24, 9, and Luke 21, 12. Matthew 24, 9. Then they will deliver you up to tribulation and kill you, and you will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. Luke 21, 12. But before all these things, they will lay their hands on you and persecute you, delivering you up to the synagogues and prisons. You will be brought before kings and rulers for my name's sake. Christians are under attack in northeast India. It's happening in the state of Manipur, where about 40 percent of the nearly three million residents are Christian. Some 34 churches have been destroyed in about a dozen villages. More than 50 Christians have been killed and at least 20,000 have fled their homes. The violence was sparked over plans by the government to give privileged status to a Hindu ethnic group in the region. Recently, CBN's Mark Martin spoke with David Curry, president and CEO of Global Christian Relief. David, who's behind these attacks on Christians and their churches? Well, there's some ethnic tensions in Manipur, uh, which is in the northeast. It's a state in the northeast of India. But the attacks have really been driven. It's been an escalation by, I think, the central government, the BJP party, which has made a, being a Christian something that's not considered part of India. It seems as though their message is, if you're not a Hindu, you're not a real Indian. And this has allowed this escalation of violence against Christians and Christian churches. We have dozens of Christian churches that have been destroyed since May 3rd when these uh, riots began. You have hundreds and thousands of people. I think we're almost up to 9,000 right now 
who have been displaced, Christians who have been displaced because of this violence. Regardless of how they frame it, whether it's ethnic violence or anarchists, it seems to always be that the Indian government is overlooking and even in some cases encouraging violence against Christians in India. Now, as you said, David, many Christians are displaced. More than 30 churches have been burned. How are they surviving right now? There's people shoulder to shoulder sleeping in shelters, makeshift uh, shelters in some cases. So they're literally just on the run. And this happened just a few months ago in November, December, January in Chhattisgarh, a totally different area. That's why I say that we have to look at the pattern of behavior. In both cases, especially right now in Manipur, we have video evidence that shows the police assisting the rioters in attacking the churches. This, this is why you have to look at what they do, not what they say. And the central government and the local government seem to be in collusion with rioters that attack Christian churches and individuals. Why is the national government fueling violence against Christians? Since 2014, when uh, Prime Minister Modi took over, he's been trying to force a one India vision, one religion, one currency. He's pushing his agenda forward. Christians are most affected in India right now because of the violence. And there's 65 million Christians there. Many of them are under severe persecution. The Christian persecution the church is suffering right now, awful as it is, will only get worse. The Bible tells us in the last days, right before Jesus returns, the greatest political leader in the history of mankind will take the world stage. He will launch a military campaign that will result in his acquiring authority over all peoples of the earth as we read in Revelation 13, 7 and 8. It was granted to him to make war with the saints and to overcome them, and authority was given him over every tribe, tongue, and nation. All who dwell on the earth will worship him, whose names have not been written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. His empire will be the most extensive in all of history, encompassing the entire world, and his rule will be the most demonic the world has ever experienced. He will appear to be the savior of the world, but as he consolidates his power, his true nature will be revealed. He will emerge as a Satan-possessed and empowered person who hates God and is determined to annihilate Christianity. His method of eliminating Christians will be by beheading as we read in Revelation 24. And I saw thrones, and they sat on them, and judgment was committed to them. Then I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for their witness to Jesus and for the word of God, who had not worshipped the beast or his image, and had not received his mark on their foreheads or on their hands. 1 Corinthians 16.13 Watch, stand fast in the faith, be brave, be strong. We do want to get right to that weekend of deadly severe weather. At least 50 reported tornadoes ripped through six states from Nebraska to Texas, killing at least two people. And overnight, flash flooding in St. Louis, Missouri, left the city underwater. More than 220 severe storm reports just over the weekend across 24 states or so. I was about to hit that tractor. From Nebraska to Illinois, at least 50 reported twisters this weekend. We're in it! We're in it! We're in the tornado! Storm chasers inside this tornado as it ripped through Spalding, Nebraska. While in Texas, winds up to 73 miles per hour. At least two people are dead and 10 injured after an EF1 tornado with winds up to 105 miles per hour tore a 200 yard wide path through Laguna Heights Saturday morning. Christopher Vasquez living to tell the tale. My whole window caved in and they picked me up off the bed and threw me into the wall. One of the victims, Roberto Flores, his cousin living just down the block. He's in heaven. He probably even didn't know. These vehicles in San Antonio submerged by flash floods. I was going down the road and all of a sudden the water just started coming up on me. Dozens of people needed to be rescued from their cars. This driver rescued just in time by firefighters. Back in Laguna Heights, the hard work to rebuild now just beginning. Keep getting together, build yourself up. Don't worry about the past, just get together. Worry about what we have right now. In Bangladesh, residents have begun returning to their homes or what's left of them after a powerful storm hit the country's coastline. Hundreds of thousands of homes have been evacuated by authorities as Cyclone Mocha made landfall.
Mocha began to crash ashore at the Bangladesh-Myanmar border on Sunday, uprooting trees and bringing driving rain to a region home to hundreds of thousands of Rohingya refugees. At least five people are reported dead in Myanmar, which was hit hardest. Bangladeshi meteorologists recorded wind speeds of up to 195 kilometers an hour with gusts and squalls of 215 kilometers an hour. Firefighters and volunteers have now begun trying to clear up, some cutting up tree trunks, blocking roads, aid workers are distributing food. But the clear-up operation will take much longer here. Some 300 houses in a Rohingya refugee camp have been destroyed. Bangladesh authorities have banned Rohingya refugees from constructing concrete homes, fearing it may incentivize them to settle permanently rather than return to Myanmar, which they fled five years ago following a brutal military crackdown. The devastation from last year's wildfires in southwestern France is clear, but less visible is what's happening underground. Near the town of Hostens, a fire has been burning beneath the earth at the site of an old brown coal reserve since July. This forest ranger says it was ignited by the blazes above ground, but no one knows how to extinguish it, so it's checked every day. There's a risk that fires could start again in these hot spots as the conditions change. As it gets warmer and dry, branches or leaves could burn. Underground fires are rare in France, but wildfires are increasingly common. Last year's were some of the worst on record, fuelled by record temperatures and drought. 30,000 hectares of forest was destroyed in the southwest alone. The mayor of Hoston says he's never seen anything like it. We saw some firefighters crying because they'd never dealt with such a terrifying situation. Some feared that they could die. This whole area was covered with trees. And what people who live in this region are really worried about is the possibility of another summer of devastating wildfires because there's been very little rainfall this year. The ground is really dry and it's getting hotter. The French government says the situation's urgent. It's launched a wildfire action plan, extra water-carrying aircraft are being brought in and more firefighters mobilised. Last year we saw many regions had large forest fires for the first time, including the Jura or even Brittany. For us, it's a clear sign of climate change. While preparation is essential, some environmentalists say that unless more is done to tackle climate change, more forests will be lost to wildfires each year and more homes and lives put at risk. The world is baffled at the events taking place in the weather, and yet it was foretold 2,000 years ago in Bible prophecy that this would happen. Satan, the great deceiver, often tries to front-run God by giving people wrong ideas ahead of time about what is prophesied to happen. Satan has tricked mankind into believing that climate change is real and in turn has blinded many people to the gospel of Jesus Christ, as we read in 2 Corinthians 4, 3 and 4. But even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing, whose minds the God of this age is blinded, who do not believe, lest the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine on them. Jesus said a sign of his return would be more frequent and more intense weather, as we read in Matthew 24, 7 and 8. And there will be famines, pestilences, and earthquakes in various places. All these are the beginning of birth pains. Pestilence is the Greek word loimus, which means a plague. Definition of a plague is any large-scale calamity, especially when thought to be sent by God. God has used plagues in the form of extreme weather in the past and will again in the future. The seventh plague on Egypt was hail. Don't forget about the famine in Joseph's time. One of the biggest is the flood in the book of Genesis. In the future, during the seven-year tribulation, God will once again use extreme weather in the form of pestilence as judgment. In Revelation 16:21, God uses hailstones weighing 100 pounds each, and great hail from heaven fell upon men, each hailstone about the weight of a talent. Men blaspheme God because of the plague of the hail, since that plague was exceedingly great. In Revelation 16, 8 and 9, God uses scorching heat. Then the fourth angel poured out his bowl on the sun, and power was given to him to scorch men with fire, and men were scorched with great heat, and they blasphemed the name of God who has power over these plagues, and they did not repent and give him glory. Climate change is simply Satan's counter to Jesus' signs of his return and the end of the age. So when Jesus Christ warns us that just before his second coming, there will be famines, pestilences, and earthquakes in various places. You had better believe that these occurrences are a sign from God and that he is about to intervene. Don't let Satan blind you to the gospel of Jesus Christ. The extreme weather the world has been witnessing is not climate change. It is God letting us know our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, is returning.
The signs of Jesus' soon return are so strong now, and the evidence is so clear that any person willing to accept the truth can see that the end of the world as we know it is near. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whoever believes in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But God demonstrates His own love toward us, in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord, that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised Him from the dead, you will be saved. These are the ABCs of salvation. A. Admit that you're a sinner. B. Believe in your heart that Jesus Christ died for your sins, was buried, and God raised Him from the dead. C. Call upon the name of the Lord, and you will be saved. Jesus paid the price for mankind's sin. He has provided a way to spend eternity with Him and the Father. All you have to do is believe in the Lord Jesus, and you will be saved. God has already done all the work. All you must do is receive, in faith, the salvation God offers. Fully trust in Jesus alone as the payment for your sins. Believe in Him, and you will not perish. God is offering you salvation as a gift. All you have to do is accept it. Jesus is the only way of salvation. That being said, we must repent of our sins. While repentance is not a work that earns salvation, repentance unto salvation does result in works. It is impossible to truly and fully change your mind without that causing a change in action. In the Bible, repentance results in a change in behavior. Repentance, properly defined, is necessary for salvation. One day, Jesus is coming. You may be at church. You may be at work. You may be asleep. God grant that you will be ready when he makes his personal appearance. My God, what if his appearance occurs on a Sunday morning. My prophetic word to you this morning is get ready! Get ready! is short. Call upon the name of Jesus today.